Um, in Hebrews chapter 4, so if everyone could turn their Bibles to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4 and we'll be reading from verse 14. We'll read through to verse 10 of chapter 5 again. Uh, but we will be, we'll be, we'll be camped, if you like, in verses 15 to 16 today. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us then with confidence, with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward since he himself is beset with weakness. Because of this he is obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins just as he does for those of the people. And no one takes this honour for himself but only when called by God just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest but was appointed by him who said to him You are my son, today I have begotten you. As he says in another place, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered, and being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him, being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Let's join in prayer one final time before we, before we get into this. <coughs> Lord God, we pray again like you said and like the song says, Lord, that you would speak to us. And Lord, similar to the song again, we ask that as you speak to us, we would be transformed. Lord God, I pray that you would encourage us with your word, that you would enlighten the word to us, that you would show us the truth and that you would really help us live by that truth in a day and age when living by the truth is hard to do at times. Lord, I pray that we would be a church of people who hold confidently to their confessions and who approach the throne of grace with confidence. Lord God, I pray that you would be close to me as I preach and that you would be close to everyone who comes and hears today, that you would bless them and that you would help them to listen to your words. Lord, help us to see what you are saying. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The main thing that I want to speak about today is the writer's exhortation that the people should with confidence draw near to the throne of grace. The writer's exhortation to the people that they should draw near in order that they would find mercy and that they would find grace in this time of need. But what I want to particularly do is focused quite heavily on verse 15 because this forms the foundation, if you like, for, for why we approach with confidence. 
When we think of this exhortation that the writer gives us to draw near to the throne, what we instantly realise is that he is inviting us to draw near to a place where God is. And he says that you can draw near confidently and and the impression that you get is that this should shock us. This should, this should definitely shock the, the people that heard this for the first time. But it should also shock this because he's asking us to draw near to a place where the Holy God resides. Where the Holy God of the Bible resides. And now to put this in context, I want to take a little story out of Esther. Um, in the book of Esther, Mordecai discovers that Haman had kind of fashioned a plan or, or, or created a plan to, what, to kill all the Jews, basically. And so Haman commands, Mordecai commands Esther to go to, who is the queen, to go to the king Ahasuerus and beg him for his favour to save the Jews. And it's a really interesting little section, but Esther responds to him by saying this, all the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that if any man or woman goes to the king inside the inner court without being killed, there is but one law to be put to death except the one whom the king holds out the golden scepter so that he may live. But as for me, I have not been called to come into the king these 30 days. Esther knew that in her approach to this human king, this king who sat on the throne, that if she approached him without favour, she would be killed. She would instantly be killed. She, and despite the fact that she, would be, that she was the queen, she would be killed. So she came with fear. And she came trembling. She came seeking prayer from her, from her friends. The writer in Hebrews is not urging us to approach a human king, a king that we see visibly with our eyes. He is, a, he is urging us to approach the God of the heavens and the earth, the same God who they had seen being approached in a far different way where they were. They had seen God being approached by a high priest who would have to be cleansed, who would have to be atoned for by sacrifice, and who would only approach once a year in a designated time. And he's saying, approach the throne confidently at all times, at any times, and do not do it petrified and fearful because you fear your lack of favour, but approach confidently in order to receive mercy and grace. This, this whole concept would have just shocked the people that received this message, and it should shock us too. Today we're going to look at a supremely important text, and, and I'm not going to handle it like it should be. Like it, should be. It, it deserves much better, but this text is just so mind-blowing, and I hope that in looking at it, that it, these words kind of reach down into your soul and they warm it for you. I hope they offer you comfort, because the privileges of being a child of God are infinite, and often we can't kind of grasp them like we should. But they're so good. They're so good. The writer of the Hebrews, as we know, is talking to the people in a special time of need. They had been struggling with this whole idea of holding fast to their confession in Christ. Now they had suffered persecution that we can't understand. They had been ostracized from their culture. They had been pushed away and they had experienced shame. They had been shamed for their faith in Jesus Christ. And for some of us as we come today, we, find it, we are finding it hard to cling to keep hold of our confession. We find the concept of approaching the throne in faith something that we find hard to deal with at the moment. We might be feeling ashamed. We might be feeling ashamed that our faith has grown weak because our culture and the, way, the place that we live is pressuring us to back away from a little bit. We may well be coming in a dry season of our life and thinking, you know, what's the point? 
what's the point in this whole Christian thing? I've, I've tried my hardest and it just seems like I'm in, in a constant dry season. We may even come after indulging in sin or living a, a sin-riddled lifestyle. And the scary thing that we get to in times like that is we realise that there's a little part of us that really enjoys that. There's a little part of us that really enjoys that and others will be coming confident in your faith. And, and this is a good thing. It is always good to be confident in your faith. But an important thing to remember is this. There are times and seasons in life when it is hard. There are times and seasons in, in your life when you won't find it easy to confess. The road is long, the, the road is rough, the road can be tough. And sometimes that little word of doubt does creep into our lives. The reality of Christ for us might grow dim, it might become flavourless, we might lose the joy and the passion. And so out of a text like this we say, for those who feel confident, take heed lest you fall. But for those who draw near in a present time of need, hear him speak to you through his word. Hear him speak to you through his word because he will be your comfort. He will be your comfort in your time of need. The first thing we're going to do, and this is going to be the majority of what we'll look at today, is we're going to look at verse 15 which urges us to consider our sympathetic high priest. <laughs> when it comes to considering Jesus Christ, I, I just cannot help but think that this little passage in Hebrews is one of the most special, the most special ways that we can view Jesus Christ because he is our sympathetic high priest. But we're going to look at what that actually means for us today. Um, sometimes when you're going through the Bible you can, you can speed up and you can cover lots of area, lots of ground, but sometimes you have to slow down and you have to admire the scenery and that's hopefully what we're going to look at today. Firstly, what we're going to look at is what does it mean to have a sympathetic high priest? Because often we, we look at a little passage like this and it, and it kind of is something that we think we know what we're talking about, but often it, it, isn't, it isn't super clear what this actually means. And the way I want to look at it today is by looking at firstly in the negative, what it isn't, and then secondly, what it actually is. I think it's a helpful way of doing that. And the first thing I want to say is that our high priest is not just. So, so be very. Listen to me when I say that our high priest is not just a sympathising spectator. Our high priest is not just a sympathising spectator. He's not just spectating on our life, looking down, watching our life with a sympathetic heart, a caring, compassionate heart. When I was farming. <coughs> Um, one of the most frustrating and hard times that I experienced on the farm was when I had to stand by helpless while, st while stock suffered. Because the thing that you come to realise in those moments is that it is completely out of my control. There is, there is nothing that I can do in this, in this storm or in this season of drought or in, this, or in this season of wetness that I can actually help my stock with. It may be the weather, it may be, it may be your own physical or emotional limitations because you end up in a place where you are useless to help but you have a heightened sense of sympathy. You are useless to help, but you have a heightened sense of sympathy. You are bound by your own humanity, but you are full of compassion. And this situation can express itself in all different sorts of ways. We can, we can think of the relationship we have with children or, or neighbours or family members where we just feel like we are helpless, but we care. We have a sympathetic heart. One of the big challenge in, challenges in this life is this. We are sometimes allowed to be burdened. We are sometimes allowed to be challenged. And the thing that we have to constantly wrestle with is this. Can God really do anything about it? Can God really do anything about it? 
Does God care about what is happening with me right now? Does he care enough to act? Will he act or will he help? And the lie of the devil that constantly comes through is that these simple two things, he can't do anything about it. He cannot help you in your situation. Either he can't, he is unable, or he won't, he chooses not to. He will not help you in the situation that you're in. And right from word go, we need to realise that this is simply untrue. This is simply not the truth. We just have to remember a book like Job and remember that in a time where these hard times were happening, God was sovereign over everything. He was in control. And this is the same for Jesus as our sympathetic high priest. He is not, he is not unable to help but looking down with a compassionate heart. He is not restricted to being a sympathetic um, spectator. We're going to look at how he does help later, but first we're going to complement this with the fact that Jesus is a sympathetic, um, a sympathetic spectator because our high priest does sympathize with us by understanding what we are going through. He does sympathize with us by understanding what we're going through, what we're feeling what we are experiencing in our kind of soul when we are battling for belief. He is a sympathizing spectator, despite not being just a sympathetic spectator. To put it simply, we would say this, Jesus knows what it feels like to experience the pain of testing. In fact, I love this passage in, in, um, in here because it says, He has been tested in every respect. Let those, let those words just kind of linger in your mind for a second. In every respect, it's quite, com quite comprehensive, isn't it? Jesus experienced it in every respect. In fact, he was the most tested man on the planet. And that's why I wanted to read Isaiah, because it, it really walks us through the pain and suffering that Jesus went through. We just have to uh, look at the different trials that Jesus experienced through his life and know that he experienced every twinge of temptation that we have because what we often do is we say, whether we want to or not, we say, how could he possibly understand? How could he possibly understand what it feels like to go through this? He is God. He's God. He, didn't, he doesn't know. But I want to flip that, on, flip that on its head today and I want to say the reality is that we can't understand what he went through. We often want to say that God doesn't understand, that Jesus doesn't understand what we went through, but I want to flip it on its head and say we can't really, ex we can't really um, understand what Jesus went through. The reason for that is this. We fall very quickly and we fall very regularly. We fall very quickly and we fall very regularly. <clears throat> we don't necessarily experience the same depths of trial that Jesus did because Jesus never fell. He never failed. He never stumbled. He never lost track. And because of this, he, he kind of went further along the road in the trials and suffering because he never kind of fell and the trials went away. And to illustrate this, I want to use a running illustration, you know, the, the act of running. In this, in, this thing, in this thing that we call life, we might call it the, the running track of life, we often run 20 laps of the track and we're going good, like we're running along, we're steaming along. Joseph might be able to run 40 laps, I'm not sure, he's pretty fit. But what happens is that we come to a point in our lives where we get tired and we give up. We're just so human. It's just the reality of it. And Jesus also ran this track. He also lived the life that we do, but he ran hundreds of laps at the track and he never stops. And what we often want to say to him is, you don't understand what it's like to fall over and find it hard. And the simple thing that Jesus responds to us with is, yes, I do. 
because I went there, I ran every lap, but because I didn't fall at lap 30, I ended up running 100. I ended up running 500. And he says, you can't understand how I felt going that far. And he says, and he says you know, you may have fell, you may have fallen, but I carried on and I experienced the heat of what it felt like to run 100 laps later and to rebuke the lie that we often listen to we have to say that Jesus understands Jesus knows these trials that Jesus experienced included things like bleeding in Gethsemane bleeding in prayer before God he was betrayed by Judas he experienced the death of his friends he wept Jesus understands that. He understands what it's like to experience persecution from religious folk, from people around him as brothers and sisters. And he experienced what it ultimately felt like to experience death. And it's so special in this passage because Jesus did all this and he did not sin. Did not sin. He didn't fall. He didn't fail. So when we come to Christ and we realize that we, are, we have grief in our life, when we're hurting, when we're struggling, come to him because he understands our weaknesses. He understands the soft spots, the points in our life where we get to when it's hard. He understands the places where we go when we aren't willing to fight. Now I, I want to use another example because I kind of want to hammer this, I want to hammer this down. And I realise that this has limitations, but the other day I was watching the semi-final, <coughs> obviously on a replay between um, Federer and Murray, the tennis semi-final. And they were both playing well, Murray's pretty good, but Federer seemed like he was playing slightly better. Anyway, after tussling it out for a long point, it was a really long one, Murray lost, Federer won, and Murray lost the plot. He basically got his tennis racket and he smashes it into the ground. And I felt myself saying, um, I felt myself sympathising with him, I could understand how it feels. But the reality was in that situation that I have no idea how it feels to, to lose to Roger Federer. I've never played him, I've never met him, I've never, I've never received a serve from him. But the thing is that I could understand what it felt like to lose in a game of tennis, because I regularly have. And the same thing can be said of Jesus. He doesn't necessarily know what it feels like to fall and to fail and to be broken, but he does know what it feels like to fight. He is carried on, so he can't, he can't sympathise with us in the way that we fall and, and, and don't make it, but he does sympathise with us, with us, and he knows how hard it is. When we are experiencing tough times, the natural way that the human heart works is that we want people to be around us who have gone through what we are going through. We find it hard to accept advice from people who haven't been there. It's just the way that we work. It's hard to have someone come and minister to us who hasn't had the trials in life as well. And the important thing to remember going out of this is that Jesus is there for you in your fight for faith. He is available to hear your burdens. He is available to hear what your heart is going through and he is sympathising with you in those hard times. And the important thing to, that I want to ask you to remember and to challenge you with is don't treat him like a friend who doesn't understand. Don't treat him like a friend who doesn't understand. Because if you are honest and you are open with him during the trial, you'll be often surprised at how precious it is to walk with it with Christ. Often people come out of seasons of hardship and they miss the relationship that they had with Jesus through the hard times because when you come out it's not this desperate kind of clinging to Christ. Treat him like the sympathetic high priest that he is. Jesus is a sympathetic high priest. He gets it and he sympathizes with us. 
<coughs> the next point that I want to look at is how does Jesus help? Jesus is sympathetic in the way that he does not stand by in our struggles but intercedes for us. Excuse me for a second. Again, this is one of the most glorious things about Jesus Christ. In John 17, I would, ask, I would urge you to read this passage afterwards. We see a glimpse of Jesus' heavenly, high priestly ministry on earth. And what he's doing in here is that he is praying for his people. He is interceding for his people. And in verse 11b, he says and prays about the apostles, saying, Keep them in your name. That is only five words, but those are supremely important words. Jesus prays to his Father, keep them in your name. And then in verse 15 he says, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. Jesus not only understands that our faith is stretched at times, but he does something about it. And the very special thing that he does is that he intercedes constantly before the Father saying, Lord, keep them in faith. Keep them in your name. Let them stretch, but do not let them go. And he says, keep them from the devil. If we were kept away from the devil and the temptations of this world, there would be no sharpening of our faith, no refining. There would be no demonstration of the genuineness of your, of your faith. Yet those of us who know ourselves well enough know how desperately we rely on the intercession of our high priest. The special thing about Jesus' answers, about Jesus' prayers, is that they are always answered in the affirmative. And I think a simple question that we can ask ourselves today is, is Jesus pleading for me before the Father? Am I fighting this alone? Or is Jesus pleading for me before the Father? The gospel of Christ gives us a special confidence that allows us to come not only aware of how sinfully broken we are, but the fact that we can come before the Lord clean, purified, and we have a mediator who is pleading for us even when we can't. And his prayers are always answered. It gives us such confidence. We started today by looking at the way that we were to approach the throne with confidence. And this is where we're going to finish. <clears throat> In the book of Esther, Queen Esther was petrified. She was, you could almost sense her trembling. And it would have been foolish of her to think of doing it in any other way. And this is the same picture that the Old Testament people saw, which the writer was writing to. The God that the people around them were looking to worship was unapproachable. He was behind a thick veil in the temple. And there were things put in place which kept the people from God because they needed to be kept, them, kept from God. But the simple thing is that we in Christ are invited. We in, we in Christ are invited to approach the throne of grace with confidence. We don't need to be kept from God because in Christ we come confidently. <clears throat> and I want to finish with this application. <clears throat> Confidence is not earned, but it is nurtured. Confidence is not earned, but it is nurtured. As we have looked at over the last two weeks, the reality of what we have is something special. The reality of what we have in Christ is something special. And we have it because of our high priest. We often lose confidence in times when we discover ourselves to be not good enough. We discover ourselves to, to be not good enough. We discover that we are, in fact, extremely sinful people. We have low moments and we realize that I'm just not good enough to come before God. Or we haven't done enough. I haven't earned the favor of the Lord this week, so why should I come confidently to Him? We've had a slack week. We haven't talked to anyone about Christ. We haven't been doing our, as much as we should. And the important thing to realize is these things are all true. 
You haven't done enough to earn your right to come before the throne. You haven't been good enough to come before the throne. But your confidence is not from there. Your confidence is in the fact that you are in Christ and in his atoning sacrifice he makes you pure and he invites you to come confidently. And so these two truths meet. As a Christian, we need to nurture our faith by reminding ourselves of the gospel. We don't need to build ourselves up to be good enough to come before God, but we need to be constantly remembering that we come confidently in Christ. We come confidently confidently in Christ. The reason we go to the throne is to receive. We don't go to... um, do a transaction and, re- and give God our good works and take merit, we go to receive favour, favour which looks like mercy and looks like grace to those who do not deserve it. You and I, all of us together before the throne, receiving. As Christians, we just take. We take, take, take. Because in, with God, we cannot give enough. So our only option is to take the grace which is offered. In the story of our lives, we will experience seasons of trial. We will find it hard to hold our confession. But what the writer is urging us to do in verses 14 to 16 is firstly cling fast to your confession. Hold fast to your confession. Cling to it like you would that bucking bronco. And then secondly, he urges us to draw near to the throne confidently. And you cannot help thinking about these two things without realising that in Christ we have so many blessings. Let's pray. Lord God, we are so thankful that we can approach you because we have access to you because of grace and because of mercy and because of our high priest. Lord God, I am so thankful for myself and I I ask that we together would join and be thankful for the privileges that we have as Christians. We often, Lord, are guilty of not appreciating you like we should for what we have. And Lord, we often try and earn our way to a satisfying relationship with you. Lord, please help us to remember the gospel and to nurture that confidence that we have in Christ. I pray, Lord, especially today for the young people and those with faith which is fragile at this time. I pray, Lord, that as they walk through the, the story of their life, that you would be pleading before the Father for their protection. Because, Lord, if you mention our name before the Father, we will be kept. And so, Lord, be close to the, to the people who are struggling. Lord, I pray also for those who are confident. <clears throat> I thank you, Lord, that in you we can have confidence. And I pray, Lord, that as the seasons of dryness and and challenge roll past, that we would still be able to cling to you with confidence. We are so happy to be your children, Lord. We are so challenged by how little we appreciate it and how little we know about it but we are thankful that you treat us like sons and daughters. We are thankful that our confidence comes in Jesus, not in our own works. And so we pray that we would continue to learn and continue to grow in our love and appreciation for you. In Jesus' name, amen.